So um, I'm, as Brian said there, I'm going to talk about um, different camera technologies, so fast and sensitive camera technologies and how to choose the best solution. Um, so the agenda, so I have a little bit of an agenda here. Um, the first thing we'll talk about is what makes a camera sensitive. Then we'll talk about EMCCD technology, followed by a CMOS technology, and then we'll do a little comparison of the various technologies, which will help you in your decision making uh, when it comes to purchasing a camera. So the first thing um, is really uh, how to choose the right camera. So when it comes to purchasing a camera, if you've never used a camera before, you're probably wondering, oh, what should I go for? What specifications um, should I look for in a camera? You know, and the most important thing is really sensitivity. Um, so you want to be able to get the most sensitive camera available. And sensitivity is very important for a number of reasons. And um, in terms of life science applications, um, you're, you're looking at these various different scenarios here. So first of all, if you're looking at um, a sample with very low fluorescent dye concentrations or single molecules, you'll need to have a very sensitive detector in order to see these. Um, also, if you're looking at doing live cell imaging, where you look, want to look at dynamic events happening over time, um, and the faster you can look at these events happening, the better, especially if they're very dynamic processes. So in order to look at this very fast uh, dynamic process, you need to use short exposure times on your camera in order to get fast frame rates. So if you've got very short exposure times, your camera is going to be exposed to um, the amount of light for a very short amount of time, and therefore it needs to be sensitive in order to pick up the light in this short exposure. As well as this, uh, in a lot of systems, you don't have the camera looking directly at the sample. Um, so in between the sample and the camera itself, you can have various objective lenses, mirrors, dichroics, etc. And this can um, have an effect on the number of photons that actually reach the sensor in the camera. So you can get a lot of uh, photon loss or rejection of photons um, in the light path traveling from the sample to the camera itself. And in that sense, sensitivity, again, is extremely important. Um, also, when you're using lower excitation powers, so you don't want to kill your sample as soon as you put it um, onto the stage of your microscope, for example. So if you want to look at uh, live cell imaging, you don't want to use very high uh, laser intensity. You want to use very low intensity so that your sample can be imaged for longer periods of time. Therefore, again, with lower excitation power, you're going to need a sensitive camera to pick up those low levels of light that are being emitted. Um, Another important factor then is when you're using uh, greater magnifications. So if you're using a 100x objective rather than a 10x objective, you're going to be spreading the amount of light that's emitted over a much larger area. So therefore, in the sensor itself, the pixels will receive less light at greater magnifications. And therefore, it's very important to have a sensitive uh, detector for this. Um, so just moving on, uh, so sensitivity is very important, as I just mentioned, but what parameters in the camera are required to make it sensitive? So there's two key parameters. The first is the quantum efficiency. So the quantum efficiency is really a measure of how efficient your camera or sensor is at converting the photons that are emitted from your sample into photoelectrons. So the higher the quantum efficiency is, the better it is. So for example, EMCCD cameras uh, are all back-illuminated cameras or sensors and they have a very high quantum efficiency. Their quantum efficiency is generally above 90%, and this means that over 90% of the photons emitted from your fluorescent sample will be converted into photoelectrons. So again, when you look at a specification sheet of a camera, so if you go to a manufacturer's website and you choose a camera that you're interested in, you go to the spec sheet, and on the spec sheet you'll see a quantum efficiency curve. So every camera has a quantum efficiency curve, and it'll tell you how efficient this sensor is at converting photo photons into photoelectrons at specific wavelengths. So generally it's over a wavelength range, and you can see, dependent on your application, what the efficiency of that camera is at your particular uh, wavelength. The second parameter then um, is the noise floor. So this image here shows you a blue ball in um, a lot of glass, and the glass is really depicting the noise floor, and the blue ball is your signal. 
So what you want in your camera is to be able to see this blue ball or the signal well above the noise floor. So you want to minimize this noise floor or have the minimum noise floor in your camera in order to have a very sensitive camera. So if you've got a high quantum efficiency and a very low noise floor, you have a very sensitive camera or you have a camera that has a high signal, which is your quantum efficiency to noise ratio. So signal to noise ratio is very important. So assuming that both of the, these parameters are, are optimized in your camera, you will have a very sensitive detector. So just moving on a little bit um, into the noise, so in terms of noise floor, the noise floor is really made up of read noise and dark noise. Now the read noise is the usual camera detection limit. So that means that uh, the faster you read out, for example, the higher the read noise, the slower you read out, the lower the read noise. So in terms of uh, controlling the read noise in your camera, if you read out very, very fast, you will have a higher read noise than if you were reading out very slow. Now this is uh, really specific for CCD cameras. Now if you're using EM CCD cameras, you can effectively remove the read noise, and with SCMOS cameras, and the read noise is inherently low in these particular sensors. But with just your general CCD camera, controlling the read noise is uh, reading out slowly. Again, on your spec sheet, you will be able to see the read noise at various different readout speeds. So these will all be um, highlighted on the spec sheet. The dark noise then is dependent on temperature. So if you can cool your camera to minus 80, minus 100 degrees, um, you, you can basically remove the dark noise. Um, so the cooler, the cooling power of a camera will basically um, dampen down this dark noise. The, all of our EMCCG cameras can be cooled, air cooled to minus 80. And if you add water cooling, they can be cooled to minus 100. Therefore, the dark noise is effectively removed. Um, so if, it's always very important when using your camera to ensure that the, the cooling is on to remove this dark noise. So you can control the dark noise and the read noise. Dark noise you can control by cooling your camera, the read noise then by reading out slowly. The shot noise then is QE and signal dependent. And you can't really control this. This is really um, an effect of the, the quantum efficiency and the signal itself. Um, but this uh, profile that we're looking at here is really just a line profile through um, an image on a, uh, on, a, on a camera. And what you can see here is the peak, which is your signal intensity, and your noise floor. So this would be an ideal situation um, in terms of having a high sensitivity and a very low noise. So in terms of quantum efficiency curves then, so quantum efficiency is the other key parameter which makes a camera sensitive. And you can see here that there are four graphs displayed. You have two graphs for back illuminated EMCCD and then two for the SCMOS cameras. So you can see already that there's a big difference in quantum efficiency. And the, the main difference or the main reason for this is that uh, the EMCCG cameras are back illuminated. So this makes them a lot more sensitive than the SCMOS cameras, which are uh, front illuminated. It makes them more sensitive in terms of quantum efficiency. So the back illuminated EMCCG uh, cameras have basically been turned upside down and they're illuminated on the back surface of the sensor. Um, and therefore you have a higher quantum efficiency. And you can see here with the blue curve that the quantum efficiency is very, very high, especially at around 500 to 600 nanometers. You're getting um, above 95% quantum efficiency. Now, when you choose a camera, if you're not interested in this particular wavelength region and you're more interested in the blue region or the near-infrared region, you can actually get coatings applied to the sensor, which makes them more uh, efficient, more quantum efficient in different wavelength regions. So the red curve here is showing you um, what we call an EX2 curve. And basically what we've done is we've applied a dual anti-reflection coating to the standard sensor. So applying a dual uh, anti-reflection coating to the sensor gives you a higher quantum efficiency here in the blue region and also in the near-infrared region. But you can see then that the visible region is affected. So it's very specific for um, your application and what uh, wavelengths are important for you. With the SCMOS graphs then, we have two. We have the green and we have the purple. Now the purple has a lower quantum efficiency than the green. And this particular uh, graph is, is depicting the 5T SCMOS sensor. So there's two sensors with SCMOS. You have a 4T and a 5T. 
and the T stands for transistor. So with the 5T or 5 transistor sensor, you have um, two exposure modes, rolling shutter and global shutter, and having this additional global shutter actually reduces the quantum efficiency um, to about 60%. So when you remove the global shutter uh, transistor from the sensor, you actually increase the quantum efficiency to about 72%. So again, depending on what you need for your application, you can either have uh, the lower quantum efficiency as CMOS 5T sensor with a rolling and a global shutter, or you can have a, a lower quantum efficiency, or sorry, a higher quantum efficiency with just the rolling shutter. So again, this is very application dependent, and I'll discuss this in more detail later. But again, just uh, in terms of QE curves, this is all available on the spec sheet, and you can see um, what, uh, what is of interest to you dependent on the application and the wavelength that you're working with. So as I said, um, in terms of read noise, the read noise in a CCD can be controlled by reading out slowly. So this image here shows you uh, an image that has been acquired using an interline CCD camera, uh, using a spinning disk confocal with the same laser intensity for both of the images, and 100 millisecond exposure, and the same relative intensity scaling. So the top image here um, has been acquired at 1 megahertz, so the 1 megahertz readout rate and this gives you one frame per second, so it's quite slow. However, you're only getting 2.4 electrons read noise. Now, if you wanted to acquire faster images using this camera, for example, using 20 megahertz readout instead of 1 megahertz, you would get much faster frame rates, 11 frames per second compared to 1 frame per second. However, your read noise increases dramatically, and you can see this in the image itself. So all of this background haze is read noise. So in terms of controlling read noise in an interline CCD camera, you would need to uh, essentially slow down the readout rate in, in order to reduce the read noise. So I'm going to move on now to electron multiplying charge couple devices, or EM CCD cameras. Now these cameras are single photon sensitive at any speed. So these cameras are extremely sensitive. If you have one single photon, in your sample, these cameras will be able to see it. So they're extremely sensitive. They're also back illuminated and therefore have a very high quantum efficiency, generally above 90% or 95% in the visible region. So they're very, very uh, quantum efficient. And there's a variety of different sensors available in the EMCCG range. So you can get very large sensors, which run at 26 frames per second, or you can get very, very small sensors, which can run extremely fast at 515 frames per second. So again, I'll show you the differences in these sensors. And it's not just the size and the speed, but it's the resolution, the pixel size. There's a lot of differences between these. So again, depending on your application, you can choose whichever sensor suits you best. Um, now, these cameras do remain the high-end choice, um, and they are perfect for single molecule detection and low-light spinning disk on focal. So if you can think of any applications for your light levels are very low, um, these cameras are ideal. And they're ideal in that you can multiply your signal on the camera itself without having to increase your laser intensity or your exposure times. Therefore, you can get very, very... Um, sensitive applications and sensitive acquisitions at very fast uh, frame rates without affecting the sample itself. So you can image for much longer periods of time with EMCCG cameras and still get a good signal to noise ratio. So how do these actually work? Um, so these cameras are, sorry, I just have to go back to this slide. So I'm just going to have to go out of the presentation and go back. So these cameras are frame transfer cameras. So essentially, they have two sensors. So you have the top part here, which is the image area, and you have the second part here, which is the storage area. So the image area will be exposed to light always, and the storage area is never exposed to light. The storage area has a mask over it, and generally an aluminum mask. Now, the, as soon as the camera receives the photons, as soon as it is exposed to light, it will send all of this information down to the storage area. And in the storage area, this is where your vertical shifting takes place. So this is where the photons are transferred from row to row, from pixel to pixel, all the way down the sensor into this readout register here. So the transfer inside the storage area is vertical. And when you get into the readout register, then this is a horizontal transfer from pixel to pixel. 
So in all CCG cameras, you have this readout register. But what is uh, different in your EM CCG cameras is that you have an additional gain register. Now, the gain register is where your electron multiplication takes place. And electron multiplication uh, is, takes place uh, through the action of a voltage. So you apply a voltage through software, and through the process of impact ionization, you can create more photoelectrons. So say, for example, you had one photoelectron here, and you applied an EM gain of 300. You would then have 300 photoelectrons. So the EM gain is real, and it's linear. Now, you have to understand that all of this amplification of your signal takes place before the E the read noise is applied. So the read noise is applied here in the AD converter. And because your signal has been amplified so much, the read noise becomes negligible. So this is the beauty of EM CCD cameras. If you have an extremely low light signal from your sample, you can amplify that signal on the camera itself without increasing the read noise. Therefore, you can read out extremely fast without having high read noise. It's also very important that you uh, minimize your your dark current. So if you have any dark current or any other noise factors inside the sensor itself, these will all be amplified uh, through the process of electron multiplication. So it's very important to cool your EMCCD camera um, and minimize any other noise factors that might be present. And therefore, you have the ability to amplify your signal well above the noise floor. Now, just to move on to the next slide, I just have to move out of the presentation, so I'll just go back in here now. And this slide really just represents what's happening in the gain register. So through this process of impact ionization, there's a probability that you can create more photoelectrons. Um, and this is shown here in this slide. So you start off on the left-hand side with four photoelectrons, and then through this process, over a number of uh, pixels in the gain register, you can create more photoelectrons, so you're amplifying your signal. So this is what happens in the camera, and when it comes to the images itself, this is what you can get. So for example, if you had an image where you had a, a huge amount of read noise and you couldn't really see your signal, um, using a CCD camera, the image on the left is what you would see. However, using EM gain, you can remove all of this read noise and get a very highly resolved and sharp image. So that's the beauty of your EM gain. Now, EM gain and EM amplification is fantastic, but there's obviously a downside to it. So there's something called a multiplication noise or a noise factor, which increases your shock noise by the factor of square root 2. So it's very important that you know when you apply EM gain, you're also introducing an additional noise factor. Um, and this noise factor increases the shock noise by a factor of square root of 2. So it's just very important that you're aware that this is happening when you're applying EM gain. Now, you can overcome this multiplication of noise by photon counting. So in terms of EMCCD cameras, uh, as I said, there's a few different sensors you can choose. So uh, we have just launched an Ixon Ultra 888. So we have always had the Ixon 888 in our EMCCD range. Um, and the, I suppose what's new about this is that it's ultra fast. So we've overclocked it so that now at a sensor format of 1024 by 1024, you can read out at 26 frames per second. Now, you can also use uh, what we term the crop mode, so you can uh, crop your sensor down to uh, a region of interest of 128 by 128 and achieve 670 frames per second. So you can essentially get very, very fast frame rates with this camera. It's also got 13 micron pixels, so very, very high resolution, and it's a USB 3 interface. Um, so this is our newest camera. We also have an Exxon Ultra 897. Now this is a 512 by 512 format in terms of the number of pixels it has. It also has 16 micron pixels and you can uh, achieve 56 frames per second with a full field of view or using the crop mode at 128 by 128 you can get 595 frames per second and this is USB 2. And finally then the, the smallest sensor that we have is a 128 by 128 sensor. This is very large pixels, 24 micron pixels. So this is really ideal for collecting a lot of light and not really getting um, highly resolvable images. So it's more for quantitative applications rather than uh, good image quality. And again, you can see that you can get very, very fast frame rates here. And this camera here is a PCI Express. <clears throat> so depending on your application, 
you have a choice of three different EMCCG sensors. They're all frame transfer sensors. They're all back illuminated, so they all have a high quantum efficiency. Um, and they're basically, if you are interested in your field of view and sensitivity and speed, you have the 888. And then sensitivity and speed, you have the 897. And large pixels, you have the 860. So you've got <clears throat> a choice of different sensors here, depending on your application. So just in terms of field of view, then, this is the difference between the three different chips or the three different sensors. So you have the large format 888, the 897, and the 860. So this is your smallest sensor here with the largest pixels. <clears throat> so in terms of then the key performance specifications and features with EMCCG, as I mentioned earlier, um, when you're using an EMCCG camera, it's very important that you minimize your dark current. So you, you must ensure that you cool your camera. So these two images depict the effect of not cooling your camera. So if you were to cool your camera to minus 30 degrees, and it can actually be cooled to minus 80, for example, or minus 85, um, you can see the amount of noise that's present in the image. Now, this is using a 30 millisecond exposure, and we're using EM gain. So if you have any other noise present in your sample, the EM gain is going to amplify the noise as well as your signal, and it will be quite difficult to determine what is the signal above the noise. So you can see here, just by cooling then to minus 85, all of this dark noise is removed from your image, so that's very important. This is also showing you line profile at, at minus 30, minus 50, and minus 85. And all of these spikes at minus 30 are showing you dark noise. Now, the reason we've mentioned here the vertical shift speed um, at 0.5 microseconds is because this is another factor. So basically, if you when you're shifting your charge from row to row in your sensor before you reach the gain register, you can create a noise called clock-induced charge. Now, clock-induced charge um, can be minimized by shifting the charge faster throughout the sensor, and this can be controlled in software. So we're shifting the charge in this particular setup as fast as possible. Therefore, we know that there's no clock-induced charge here, and it's only dark noise that's um, giving us these uh, spikes in our line profiles. But you can see the spikes are reduced at minus 50, and they're essentially removed here at minus 85. So again, just very important to use your uh, cooling power of your camera in your EMCCG. Now, if you do have very, very weak um, samples, very, very weak uh, fluorescent samples, and you have to use very long exposures, so increasing your exposure time will also increase your dark current, you have the ability to use uh, water cooling. So. This here is showing you two images. On the left-hand side, air-cooled to minus 70. And on the right-hand side, then, you have a water-cooled image at minus 95. So you can see the intensity then comes up above the background with additional cooling. Um, so this is for very low, like, luminescent-type experiments or bioluminescence, where you have to use longer exposures and water cooling to uh, increase your signal above the, the noise. Um, now, this is what I was mentioning here about the clock-induced charge. So again, you want to reduce your clock-induced charge so that you're not going to amplify that in the gain register as well. So this shows you two, three different speeds, 0.5 microseconds, 1.7 microseconds, and 3.3 microseconds. Now, these are the, the speeds which, with which you can transfer your, your photoelectrons in the sensor itself. So you can see the lowest clock-induced charge is uh, given to us by using the fastest transfer speed, so 0.5 microseconds. So having your camera cooled and using the fastest clock-induced charge speed that you can for your particular application gives you the, the minimal noise, um, and it ensures that you're only amplifying your signal in the gain register. Now, another feature with which um, our cameras have to improve the speed of your EMCCG cameras is this uh, thing which we call the crop mode. Now, the EMCCG cameras are very sensitive, but they're also very fast. Um, and you can use a region of interest to increase the, the speed. Excuse me. <clears throat> you can use uh, your region of interest to increase the speed of your camera. Um, but as well as this, you can use a crop mode. Now, the crop mode essentially fools the sensor into thinking it is smaller 
than it effectively is. So if, for example, you have, um, you're have you using the Ixon Ultra 888, which has a 1024 by 1024 sensor, and you use the crop mode of 128 by 128, you can actually achieve 670 frames per second. Um, however, if you were just using a region of interest at 128 by 128, you would only get 171 frames per second. So using a crop mode where you're telling the sensor that it is now only a 128 by 128 sensor, um, you're basically able to get the type of frame rates you would get from a much smaller sensor. And what you need to use with this is an opto mask. Now the, the opto mask is applied as um, an exterior accessory which can be attached to the camera via C mount and you can adjust metal blades uh, around this cropped region of interest to ensure that no light enters around the edges. So if you don't have an opto mask present you can get a lot of artifacts around the edge of your region of interest. Now what we've also recently added is an optically centered uh, crop mode. So you can have the crop mode um, in the bottom left hand corner of your sensor which is closest to the readout register um, or you can have it optically centered um, in the center of your sensor and this is ideal for a lot of applications and it was basically for customer feedback that we added this uh, to ensure that everything is optically centered on the whole setup. And therefore, you can see two speeds here, 670 for the corner tethered and 697 for the optically centered uh, crop mode. So it's a way of increasing your frame rates in your camera. Now, this just shows you uh, an image of the opto mask. So here you can see the opto mask and the four metal blades. So these can be adjusted manually. Um, there's also another opto mask available now, which is preset uh, for the optically centered uh, modes and there's four predefined regions of interest that have been set on the OptoMask itself so you don't have to manually adjust anything, you can just click them into place. And these can be used on the Ixon Ultra 888 and the 897 um, to give you much faster speeds. So another um, aspect of the Ixon Ultra is that you can now um, get direct data access. Um, so with the Ixon Ultra 897 and the 888, they're both USB cameras. So one's a USB 2 and the other's a USB 3. However, you can use a camera link output on each of these cameras in order to access the data um, that's coming off the camera before it reaches the computer. And it allows you then to do your processing. So it's very important for adaptive optics and super resolution microscopy. So we do have um, a tech note on this, and you can read this on the Andor website. So in terms of applications where EMCCD are important, so you're looking at single molecules, so any applications where your levels of light are very low. So for example, if you're a microscopist and you look through the microscope at your sample and you can't see anything at all, and you know that there's something there, EM, EM gain is required in order to see that signal. So single molecule detection, super resolution and tracking, vesicle trafficking, cell motility. So these again are um, live cell applications. So the EM gain, um, ability of the camera is ideal for live cell applications where you don't want to use high laser power, you don't want to use long exposure times, therefore you can use the gain of the camera to amplify your signal. Calcium ion signaling, voltage sensitized and fluorescence correlation spectroscopy. So as you can see, EMCCG cameras cover a wide range of applications. Um, the cameras can also be used as standard CCD cameras, so you don't have to use them as EM CCD cameras. So, for example, if you had a, a sample that was very bright um, and you just wanted to capture pretty images, you can do so using the CCD functionality of the EM CCD camera, so you don't have to use the EM gain. So I'm going to use, uh, move on now to the SCMOS cameras. Now SCMOS are extremely different from EMCCD or CCD architecture. So they're, they're very different and um, it's very important that people understand the differences between SCMOS and EMCCD. And the difference is really that the scientific or the SCMOS is unique in simultaneously offering extremely low noise, rapid frame rates, wide dynamic range, high resolution and a large field of view. So you can get noise down to 0.9 electrons, and this is inherent in the camera itself. You don't have to use an amplification step in order to get this low noise. 
there are rapid frame rates. So you can, using either 5.5 megapixel or 4.2 megapixel, you can acquire 100 frames per second full frame. And in order to see very weak and very bright signals simultaneously in one image, um, this camera is ideal with a 33,000 to 1 dynamic range. So um, you're getting all of this in one package. Now the difference between FCMOS and CCG is really the architecture here, as you can see. So with your CCG camera, your sensor, so all of these little squares here in your sensor are your pixels, so the pixels will receive light, or photons, the photons will be converted to photoelectrons in each pixel, and then these photoelectrons will be transferred vertically in the sensor, all the way down to the reject register, and then horizontally transferred here, and the charge to voltage conversion happens here in the AD converter. In your SCMOS chip, then, every single pixel will receive light, will receive photons, will convert those photons to photoelectrons, and will then read out that charge. So the, the pixels do not have to transfer a charge vertically down the sensor. Everything happens in the pixel itself. So essentially, the pixel in an SCMOS camera is almost like a, a camera itself. It's almost like a sensor itself. So every single pixel in an SCMOS sensor has slightly different read noise, because they're all doing their own readout. Um, and therefore, the fact that they're all doing their own readout and the camera doesn't have to transfer any charge vertically, you get much, much faster frame rates. So you can increase the frame rates dramatically, but also with the SCMOS uh, chip, the, the, the read noise is inherently low, so it's something very important. No amplification stage has to be applied in order to get low read noise. Now this image down on the right-hand side is uh, depicting a pixel from an SCMOS chip. So the SCMOS chip is front illuminated, it's not back illuminated like the EMCCD chip. So you can see all of the electronics are covering over the pixel here. Now these electronics are what enable the different exposure modes in an SCMOS camera. So you can see here you've got reset transistor, row select bus, amplifier transistor, so all of this electronics is present. So this is covering over the top of the sensor and every pixel therefore it has less available space for the light or the photons to enter. So therefore, you've got a lower quantum efficiency. So what we've done then is uh, micro lenses are applied to the top of every single pixel, and the micro lenses focus the light inside this light sensitive area. So that's required in order to get your quantum efficiency up to about 60 to 70 percent. Um, okay, so we'll move on. What on we actually have uh, in terms of SCMOS is we have two uh, cameras. We have a Neo SCMOS and a Xyla SCMOS. So the Neo SCMOS camera is a 5.5 megapixel sensor, and it's the only vacuum-cooled CMOS in the market. So this camera can be cooled to minus 40 degrees, and this picture here uh, shows you the, the Neo. Um, now with the Xyla, the Xyla is much smaller than this. I don't have a picture of this here, but later on we can see it. Uh, it's, so it's much smaller, and there's two variants of the Xyla. You've got a 5.5 megapixel and a 4.2 megapixel sensor. The Neo itself can, is a three-top camera, and you can acquire 30 frames per second sustained, whereas the Xyla um, is available as both a three-top and a ten-top and USB 3. So you've got different variants depending on the speed you're interested in. So again, just recently we launched the Xyla USB 3. So the Xyla USB 3 comes in both the 4.2 megapixel chip and the 5.5 megapixel chip. And you can see here, in terms of frame rates, um, with the 5.5 megapixel chip you're getting 40 frames per second with the full uh, field of view, and with the Xyla 4.2, so it's a slightly smaller chip, you're getting 53 frames per second. So very, very fast frame rates. And as you can see, as you reduce the region of interest here, you can get up to 1,500 frames per second in the Xyla 4.2 and 1,600 in the Xyla 5.5. So the frame rates are dramatically different from the, um, the EMCCD camera. And this is without using crop mode. This is just using your regions of interest. And you can hear, see here the differences between rolling shutter and global shutter. So the global shutter essentially is the same in USB 3 uh, until you reach these very small regions of interest. So you can see that the global shutter does have slightly reduced frame rates, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. So in terms of performance and innovations then, just with SCMOS, um, as I mentioned, the SCMOS 
every single pixel has, a, has its own reject noise. So essentially, there's a little bit of variability from pixel to pixel. Um, and what we have to do is ensure that the image quality um, for the end user is, is going to be good enough to be used for scientific purposes. So what uh, we've done is we've compensated for um, these differences from pixel to pixel. And this reduces this uh, fixed pattern noise, which appears, and it also reduces, reduces the noise values. So the SCMOS carries uh, offset compensation data for every single pixel, and the data is stored for each speed at each gain and at each cooling temperature. Now what we've also applied is a dynamic baseline clamp, and you can see here the difference on the left-hand side, this is where we've used the dynamic baseline clamp, and on the right-hand side, this is where we've not used the dynamic baseline clamp, and you can see these horizontal banding or horizontal rows here. So again, using this dynamic baseline clamp, you can improve the image quality dramatically. Also with SCMOS, in EMC CD cameras, all of your read noise happens in one node. Um, so you've got one read noise value which is uh, given for different readout speeds. Now with the SCMOS, you have generally, it's, it's displayed as a read noise distribution. So this is depicted here for the NEO SCMOS. And you can see here um, that the NEO, the median read noise of the NEO is 1.1 electrons which is extremely low read noise and um, when you consider what the interline CCD camera has. So an interline CCD camera at 20 megahertz has six electrons read noise. Now this is a 20 megahertz readout rate and we're considering the NEO at 1.1 electrons at 560 megahertz. So it's dramatically faster and much, much lower read noise. And again it's important to note that 95% of the five and a half million pixels on the Neo SCMOS has less, have less than three electrons read noise. So the read noise is extremely low. Now another thing which, which we've done is we've applied, um, well this is available for the user, so it's a spurious noise filter. So when you use uh, an Android camera you have the ability to turn on um, or turn off uh, a spurious noise filter. And this is really for approximately 1% of the pixels which have a, a read noise greater than 5 electrons. So there are a number of pixels, um, about 1% of the total number of pixels in your SCMOS chip which will have a read noise greater than 5. And if you use the spurious noise filter, this will remove these uh, very noisy pixels from your image. And in low light images, the spurious noise effect is analogous to what you see in EMCCDs with the clock induced charge. So this image here is showing you on the left hand side the noisy or spurious noisy spurious noise pixel or spurious noise filter being it's turned on here and it's off here. So on the right hand side you can see all of this the salt and pepper effect. So this is all of your spurious noise, all of those read noise um, values which are above five electrons. However, this is a, a filter that can be turned off by the user, so it's not something that's built into the hardware itself. It can be turned on and off um, using the software. Now, the Neo is um, the, the, the only SCMOS in the market that can be cooled to minus 40, and it's very important that you know why this is important. So with the Neo, if you're using very long exposures with the SCMOS, you can increase your dark current dramatically. Um, and what the cooling does for NEO is it, it reduces the dark current. So you can see here in this profile at minus 40, you've got very few spikes or hot pixels, I should say, and at plus 5 degrees. So if we didn't have cooling on the camera, all of these spikes would appear as uh, hot pixels in your image. So it's, um, with the deep cool NEO, uh, you don't have to compensate for nearly as many hot pixels. So with a, an SCMOS chip, you do have hot pixels, and these are pixels which have a greater um, noise value compared to their surrounding pixels. Um, and when you cool the NEO, you don't have to compensate for these particular pixels. However, if you don't cool for these uh, particular uh, pixels, you do have to add a, a, a noise compensation to remove them from the sensor. So it shows you here some statistics. If you were not cooling your camera and you had your camera cooled to plus 5 degrees, uh, 28,500 pixels would have uh, 2 electrons per pixel per second. So they'd have a greater 
than two electrons per pixel per second. However, if you cool to minus 30, uh, only 1,800 pixels have greater than two electrons per pixel per second. So you can see the value of cooling your SCMOS chip here in terms of the number of pixels that have high noise values. So one of the, the advantages of SCMOS is really the speed. So with the, the Zyla 10 tap camera or the USB 3 cameras, you can get very, very fast frame rates. And this is really showing you the 10 tap camera. So 10 tap means that you can acquire 100 frames per second at the full field of view in rolling shutter mode. So this is really showing you the rolling shutter and the global shutter. So it's the 5.5 chip. So as I mentioned, there is two uh, SCMOS cameras, you can get a 4.2 or a 5.5, and they differ in terms of the size of their sensor and the exposure modes that they offer. So having a global shutter and a rolling shutter um, is a 5T chip, so it's five transistors, and if you only have a rolling shutter, you have a 4T or a four transistor chip. So you can see here, the frame rates in rolling shutter, you can get 100 frames per second, um, at the full field of view, and using global shutter for the full field of view, it reduces it by half. Um, now, with the, as you reduce your region of interest, you can increase your, your frame rate dramatically, so up to 1,600 frames per second. So you can actually get very, very fast frame rates with the SCMOS cameras. So this slide is going to show you the differences between the 4.2 and the 5.5, or the 4T and the 5T uh, chip. So basically, the, the 4.2 has a 4.2 megapixel chip. The 5.5 has a 5.5 megapixel chip. And the difference here is really the quantum efficiency. So with a 4.2 megapixel chip, you have a 72% quantum efficiency. Um, now, it's 12% higher than the 5.5 quantum efficiency. However, you only have a rolling shutter exposure mode, whereas the 5.5 has rolling and true global shutter. So it's very important that you understand the differences between that, and I'm going to go through them in the next slide. Um, and the applications then that are uh, supported by these cameras, uh, with the Zyla 4.2, super resolution, light sheet microscopy, and turf microscopy would be ideal applications for this camera with the high quantum efficiency. You can see that the read noise is very low in both cameras, the dark noise is very low, the frame rates are very fast, and the dynamic range is excellent. With the Zyla 5.5 then, you really um, are suited to uh, multi-dimensional microscopy, digital pathology, high content screening, and we actually marketed the Zyla 5.5 as the interline replacement because um, all of its qualities um, are better than an interline in terms of its field of view, its frame rate, and its noise and dynamic range. And again, you'll see that when I go through the differences between the different uh, sensors towards the end of this talk. So I'm going to move on to the next slide, actually, and we'll look at the differences between the rolling shutter and the, the global shutter. So in terms of the FCMOS, um, everything happens from the middle of the sensor outwards in both directions. So the first video here shows you the rolling shutter uh, mode in action. So what happens is, in rolling shutter, the center of the sensor will begin exposure, and each row from the center will move out um, in a row-by-row -row fashion, and there will be a 10 microsecond delay from row to row. So as the um, sensor gets activated to expose, the, the movement of the exposure will uh, happen in row-by-row -row fashion, 10 microseconds from the center, and each row will move across the sensor. So to expose the full sensor, there'll be a 10 millisecond, um, it takes 10 milliseconds. So it's very important to understand, if you're looking at very dynamic um, events happening using the rolling shutter, you can miss things happening because the rolling shutter hasn't reached the part of the sensor where your actual sample is moving. So for example, if you have something moving up in the top left-hand corner, um, at the same time as something moving in the center, your rolling shutter will miss the events that are happening at the top. So for example, if you're looking at calcium imaging experiments where you want to see sparks in multiple cells at the same time in one image, you're going to miss the sparks that are happening at the top or the bottom of your image um, because of the rolling shutter not being there to capture those events. Also, if you're looking at very large dynamic objects moving, um, you will see a distortion in the uh, resulting images due to the rolling shutter effect. Now, with global shutter, 
global shutter is analogous to the interline sh snapshot mode and therefore everything um, or all pixels will be exposed at the same time. So in global shutter all pixels are exposed at the same time and all pixels read out at the same time so you have no transient phase. The transient phase is really what happens in the rolling shutter mode and it's very important then when you're choosing a camera um, or an SDMOS camera that you choose whether you're having a rolling shutter or global shutter. Okay, so we'll move on to the next slide. Okay, so this is really just to show you for a particular application for calcium or ion imaging. This is from one of our customers um, and they needed a global shutter because what they wanted was um, they wanted to see calcium imaging of inner hair cells and they wanted to see these bright spots appearing simultaneously when the electrical stimulation was given. And they wanted these uh, spots in a single frame to correspond to the same time point. And this is only possible with the global shutter mode. Okay, so for some reason my presentation has, oh, there we go, I thought it had stopped there. So this is uh, where you need uh, global shutter. It's very important for this type of application that global shutter is used. Another application then, uh, this is where rolling shutter produced artifacts. So this is an image of an intact sperm beating at 30 waveforms per second, and you're looking at global and rolling shutter. So you can see in global shutter you have the correct um, shape that you want and when you move over to rolling shutter you can see the distortion. Now this is because the sample itself is moving faster than the rolling shutter is moving across the sensor and you're getting um, your distortion there. Another application then where global shutter is very important is where you're looking at the fast movement of cells. So this particular application is where cells are being pushed through a microfluidic chamber at speed. So this is about 5 to 10 millimeters per second um, with the movement of these particular cells. And you can see in the middle here, um, the rolling shutter is causing distortion to the shape of the cells itself. So this particular application requires the global shutter to prevent this distortion. Another application then where uh, global shutter is required, this is uh, where the, the group are looking at the movement of blood cells through the eye. And they're using the SEMOS camera with adaptive optics and it's a very fast application and due to the blood flow and the speed of the movement of the blood flow, when they used a rolling shutter of the camera, they saw a significant warping. And so therefore they had to move to a global shutter mode in terms of acquiring their images. So I've been talking about how global shutter is better than rolling shutter. However, for the majority of life science applications, rolling shutter can be used because the uh, sample, for example, if you're looking at the movement of a vesicle with inside a cell, the cell is actually moving um, very small distances from frame to frame and therefore the rolling shutter will have no effect at all. The rolling shutter uh, would be moving significantly uh, faster than the movement of this particular uh, vesicle, for example. So for the majority of life science applications, rolling shutter will be fine. So it's really important, I suppose, when you have, you have SCMOS cameras which have only rolling shutter, or you have SCMOS cameras which have rolling and global, so which one would you choose? Um, and why would you choose it? So having a rolling shutter will uh, give you the lowest possible read noise. It will also give you the fastest frame rates when you're not synchronizing to other peripherals. Um, and I'm going to go into that a little bit in the next slide. Um, you don't get any spatial distortion with, uh, or sorry, if you don't want spatial distortion, you wouldn't use a rolling shutter. Um, also, if you want to acquire exact correlation in time between separate, separated regions of your image, then you wouldn't use a rolling shutter. Rolling shutter can be difficult to synchronize and it can result in longer cycle times or slower frame rates when synchronizing to peripherals. However, with global shutter, it's analogous to interline CCD snapshot, so people are familiar with it. It's distortion free, it's very simple to synchronize to. You can acquire faster cycle times when you're synchronizing to peripheral devices. Um, you're also guaranteed time correlation between separate regions of your image um, and that's based on the calcium image example that I showed. However, your read noise is compromised slightly, so you will have an increased read noise 
and the maximum frame rate can be compromised when you're not synchronizing. So your maximum frame rate can be reduced from 100 to 50 frames per second for the full frame. So it's important that you know the differences between these two modes and why they're suitable for different applications. So if, for example, you purchased a Xyla 4.2 camera or a 4T chip or a, a, just a camera that just had a rolling shutter mode but you wanted to use a global shutter mode, um, you can actually simulate it. So what manufacturers have done is in the cameras that just have rolling shutter mode, they have um, allowed the user to simulate a global shutter mode. And this allows you then to um, remove this transient phase of the rolling shutter and prevent any distortion from affecting your image. So it is possible to strobe a light source to come on during a period of the exposure cycle that is not transient. So this is possible um, and it, it's when the, the row exposures are not being started or stopped. So it's when the camera is ready to receive light and when there's no movement of the rolling shutter. So when all pixels are ready to, to receive photons. So the advantages of using a 4T camera with a simulated global shutter mode are that, first of all, you will have no illumination during the transient part of the cycle, so during the phase where your rolling shutter is moving across the sensor. And you will also have the lowest possible read noise because you're essentially using the rolling shutter mode to simulate your global exposure. The disadvantages are that you can get a lower signal to noise ratio or longer cycle times. It's complex to set up and configure, and it, it is dependent on a strobed or pulse light source. So in order to use a 4T camera with a simulated global shutter mode, you do need a strobe or pulse light source. So I'm just going to go through this um, very quickly because I know I'm limited with my time here. Um, so this really just shows you when you receive an FCMOS camera, you will get a trigger cable with it. And in order to simulate a global exposure mode, on the 4T camera, you need to use the firewall of the trigger cable. Now, the firewall will basically turn on the light at this point here, and it will leave the light on until this point here. So this slanted line is showing you the transient phase of the rolling shutter, and this is where you're exposing the camera or getting the camera to be ready to be exposed. So the light is not turned on while the transient phase is taking place at the beginning or at the end of the exposure. So it's important that you use the firewall trigger. And this is showing you now how you can target 50 frames per second with the SCMOS using this simulated global shutter mode. So you have a rolling shutter camera, which you're going to simulate global shutter. So this is your frame. So this is the beginning of your exposure. So this is the transient phase of the rolling shutter where it's moving across the sensor. Um, this is your exposure, so this is when your sensor is exposed to light, and then this is the beginning of the next uh, frame. So you can see all of this time in between frames is essentially dead time, and you're not receiving any information. The camera's not receiving any information at this point here, so it's dead time. However, if you had a true global shutter mode, you would have no dead time from frame to frame, and therefore you would have um, a full amount of exposure. So your camera would receive more light, therefore a higher signal to noise ratio. So if you're using a 4T camera, which is rolling shutter only to simulate global shutter, you will have 50% dead time associated with it. Therefore, you'll have a, a lower signal to noise ratio. And with the true global shutter, then you have a 0% dead time. So just in terms of this, um, this is really just to show you um, using true global shutter how you would set it up. So for example, you'd use the Fire One trigger cable of your camera. Um, you would just use your global shutter in your camera as well, so you turn on global shutter in the software. You would start your exposure, so all rows expose at the same time, so there's no transient phase at the beginning, there's no transient phase at the end, all um, pixels read out at the same time, and your exposure time is for the full length of the, the camera exposure, for the full length of this uh, particular 20 milliseconds. So the cycle time is 25 milliseconds, 20 milliseconds to expose your camera, and then you've got a 5 millisecond dead time, for example, if you wanted to change your wavelength, or you, so if you're connected to a peripheral device. This is very important if you're using the camera with peripheral devices, such as uh, filter switches, Z stages, etc. So if you want to change, for example, the Z position um, in between frames, you can do that here in the 5 millisecond time between frames. So it's very easy to configure, it's simple to configure, the shortest cycle time, and 20% dead time, and there's no transient exposure here.
Now, if we go to the next scenario where you're using your um, 4T sensor, which is a rolling shutter only with a simulated global mode, um, you would need to turn the global clear mode on in your software. You would need to use the firewall trigger of your camera. Um, and then you have your 20 milliseconds exposure, but you cannot have it on during the transient phase. So therefore, you're having less exposure to your camera. Your cycle time is increased to 30 milliseconds because of this 10 milliseconds readout. So it takes the full 10 milliseconds to read out the full sensor, and it's transient phase, so you don't want to have light on during the transient phase. So it's longer cycle time, increased dead time, 33%. It's complex to configure, and it's not eliminated during the transient phase, which is good because you don't want to trans uh, eliminate it during this phase. But it's very important that it's not easy to set up. You need a pulse or a strobe light source. Um, and it would be easier if you had a 5.5 camera with both global and rolling shutter. Um, but it is possible to simulate your global shutter or global exposure on your rolling shutter only camera. So just very quickly now, I'm going to go through my um, image technology. So this is, this is the comparison of technologies. So it's showing you the Sony Interline, EMCCG, and FCMOS. And you can see in terms of sensor format, FCMOS has the largest sensor format. You've got a range of sensor formats from EMCCG, and the Interline was 1.4 megapixels. So Andor really brought out the FCMOS camera to take over the Sony Interline. And you can see in all aspects, it's better. So you've got a larger field of view, you've got a, a big, a faster frame rate, you've got much lower read noise, it's got the same quantum efficiency, much, much higher dynamic range. <clears throat> and then when it comes to EMCCG, it's a different camera. So you're using EMCCG for very, very low light, for single molecule detection, single photon counting. Um, it's got a high quantum efficiency. They're all back illuminated um, chips. And then you have your, your fast frame rates here. And you can get even faster using your crop mode in your region of interest. So there is the difference in terms of technologies. Um, and in terms of field of view, then you have your FCMOS, with CMOS camera, which is a very large field of view, compared to the um, Sony Interline camera, which was a 1.4 megapixel chip. And in terms of signal to noise, FCMOS has a much, much higher signal to noise compared to an Interline camera. So the orange curve here is your FCMOS, whereas the blue is your interline. So over a large range, so this is um, your number of photons per pixel. So going from 0 to 1,000 photons per pixel, you can see that the FCMOS camera is a much, much better camera until you get to very, very bright signals. And this is really just to show you the difference in image quality. Very low read noise and much higher read noise here with the Sony interline camera. So comparing then EMCCG or FCMOS, just again very quickly, I've only got a couple of slides left. Um, this really just shows you the crossover point. So the crossover point here between EMCCG and FCMOS is 10 photons per pixel. So that means if you have 10 photons per pixel or less, you need to use an EMCCG camera. And anything greater than 10 photons per pixel, you could use an FCMOS camera. So again, the FCMOS camera is ideal for very low light applications. Um, going down to as low as 10 photons per pixel, and even lower than that, you would need to use an EMCCG for the signal-to-noise advantage. Again, this is just showing you the image quality, so FCMOS across the top, EMCCG across the bottom. Very bright light, both cameras would work fine, um, not so bright as so 68 photons per pixel. Again, FCMOS and EMCCG will work fine. Um, and when you're in the very low light regime of 8 photons per pixel, so less than 10 photons per pixel, you can see that the EMCCG wins out over FCMOS. Um, so just to conclude, I suppose, um, single molecule detection. Generally, single molecule detection dominates the extremely low light regime. Um, and an EMCCG camera would definitely win out over an FCMOS for single molecule detection. However, using Q dots, um, for single molecule detection, the FCMOS could potentially be used for the so EMCCG is ideal for low light applications such as spinning disk confocal and single molecule detection. Whereas for live cell imaging, FCMOS holds more potential, greater flexibility um, in terms of field of view, resolution, and speed. Also, FCMOS is a, and it's a cost-effective workhorse, so it covers a wide range of applications. 
And just at the moment, um, SCMOS is really popular for light sheet microscopy. So it's one area where it's um, the ideal detector. So I'm sorry I've gone over my time a bit, um, but I'd like to thank you for your attention. Um, and I'm not sure if we have any time for questions, but uh, Brian, I don't know if you want to take over now.